And then our next passage comes from Matthew 26, starting in verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And then a little later, in verse 27, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this very day. This is the word of God for the people of God. When Tom Toole was preaching that wonderful sermon last week about Jesus's breakfast on the beach, the one where he forgives and reinstates and commissions Peter to a second chapter of discipleship, I couldn't stop thinking about another who knew Jesus at least as well as Peter did, who knew him at least as well or much better than any of us will ever know Jesus. There was a man who knew exactly what Jesus looked like and sounded like, and the color of his hair. He knew what Jesus' little quirks were and the pet peeves that bothered him. They laughed together and played together. They worked and served alongside of each other. There would be nights when they would fall asleep next to the fire together. His name was Judas Iscariot. Does that seem strange to you? I know it seems a little bit weird to me. I mean, Judas is that guy who I have had no problem hating my entire life. Isn't it true? He's the one that we all love to hate, isn't he? We human beings, we hate to have fuzzy borders around things, don't we? We want our blacks to be black. We want our whites to be white. I want to be able to put my good people over here and my bad people over there and not have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out a whole lot of nuance to it. For me, it is just so much easier to put people into boxes. I do it with all the people in my life. I do it to my family and my friends and my colleagues. I for sure do it to my politicians, to my heroes and my villains, and even to God. It is so much easier for us to put people into boxes, isn't it? And if there's anyone that we ought to be able to put into a box, we would think it would be Judas Iscariot, right? I mean, even Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein are like Galinda the Good Witch compared to this guy. He is the man that we all hate without a second thought about it, isn't he? To put this into perspective, just about 20 years ago, there were still 75,000 people living on the face of this earth named Adolf. And I understand that some of those may have been old enough to have been named before 1945, but even about 10 years ago, one in every 27,000 babies was being named Adolf. In contrast, can you even imagine how many children have been named Judas in the last 2,000 years? How many parents have even allowed that name to be on the short list of their names? 
Judas is certainly the person we all love to hate. And for those of us who follow a faith that's based on forgiveness and graciousness, who believe in the bottom of our hearts that there is nothing we can do that to separate us from the love of God, isn't it a curious amount of hatred and unforgiveness that we hold for this one particular man without even giving it a second thought? I heard of one Sunday school teacher who was teaching second graders who asked, do any of you know who the one who betrayed Jesus was? And one little boy raised his hand and he said, oh, I know, I know. It was Judas the scariest. <laughs> he is one person whose reputation certainly goes ahead of him. But you know, the more that I get to know Judas, the more I start to realize that he's a whole lot more like me than I am prepared to admit. And now don't get me wrong, I have a lot at stake, both personally and professionally, with creating as much distance between myself and Judas as possible. But when I start to really look into it, when I take him out of the box and I start to really examine him in all of his complexity, I realize that he's a lot more complicated than certainly I want him to be. So what do we actually know about Judas? Well, first of all, we know that he is one of the 12 people in the entire world that Jesus chose to be one of his beloved disciples. He's one of those that Jesus spent three years pouring his life into, and that Judas, for three years, did everything for and with Jesus. He taught and cast out demons in Jesus' name. He followed Jesus from village to village and up into dusty mountains. He went in went with him into every hardship and difficult situation they faced. Judas was there through it all. When they were searching for food, Judas went hungry with the rest of them. He submitted to Jesus, and he followed Jesus, and he loved Jesus. There is no question about any of that. We also know that Judas was chosen to be the treasurer, the one who kept the money for the entire group by Jesus and by the disciples. You have to stop to think, what sort of person ever gets elected to be the treasurer of most organizations? Isn't it just our basic instinct to trust our hard-earned cash to the most upright, wise, squeaky clean, dependable, Mike Oroz-ish kind of person that we can find? We also know that Judas had a real heart for service and mission and justice. He was basically the Laura East of the group, or the Steve Ruth. Over and over again, most of the times that we hear about Judas outside of this dinner, outside of this betrayal, it's when he's caring for and thinking about the poor. I don't know if you remember that time when Judas was with Jesus in the home of Simon the Pharisee for dinner and he went berserk because Mary had just poured like a gallon of Versace's brand new perfume on Jesus' feet. Do you remember what Judas says? He goes crazy saying, if we had sold this perfume, we could have funded the budgets for My Friend's Place, Hope on Union, Westminster TLC, and a more for an entire year. Can you imagine all of the socks that we could have bought? Or all of the backpacks we could have made for TGS? Judas was always thinking about the poor. He was also the guest of honor for that dinner that we celebrated through that Zoom call just about two weeks ago now. We know from scripture that John was sitting on the right side of Jesus during the Last Supper. He would have been the one who would put his head onto Jesus's chest when they reclined. But we also know from ancient Near East tradition that it was the person who was sitting to the left of the host. That was the guest of honor position. That was the position that Jesus would have actually put his head on that person's chest. 
We also know from tradition that they had a, a custom that was very similar to our toasting a person of honor at a table. They would break the bread and they would begin the meal by dipping the bread into the bowl and giving it to the guest of honor. And as we just read, as Jude just read for us in the Gospel of John, this is exactly what Jesus does to Judas. Judas was the one sitting in that seat of honor at that dinner. He was the one that Jesus would have shared a bowl, them both dipping their fingers into the same bowl together throughout the meal. And I can understand just how absolutely horrifying that sounds after this year that we've just been through. In fact, I wasn't sure that I was going to do this, but I don't know if you've seen those Mint Mobile ads for uh, That Ain't Right, but uh, I want you to watch this one if you haven't seen it yet. That's not right. It's right, all right. Finger dipping? That's not right. That dip look good. Oh, that does look good. You gotta try this. Mmm, oh. that's so good. That's not right. So that ain't right. <laughs> Isn't that disgusting? And yet what it shows us is just how intimate, how close Jesus and Judas were. Judas was committed, he worked hard, he cared about the poor, he sacrificed for Christ, and he was dearly loved by Jesus. I mean, don't you think that if it was obvious, if people thought about Judas the way we think about him today, that the disciples would have been really clear when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, that they would have all known exactly who it was? That they wouldn't have sat around the table saying, is it me, Lord? Could it possibly be me? Could I be doing this? I mean, they must have thought that Judas was at least as unlikely or more unlikely than any of them. If they had thought about Judas the way we do today, they would have been like, oh, well, that's a no-brainer. It must be that lying, cheating, good-for-nothing worm of a man Judas. We've just been waiting for him to do something like this. But no. They are as shocked that it could be Judas as anyone. So what went wrong? How did things fall apart so quickly? Some of the commentators think that it's basically that Judas had a very different agenda than Jesus did in those last days. That Judas, like the crowds who welcomed Jesus with the shouting of Hosanna and the waving of the palms, that Judas expected Jesus to come to start a military coup and to kick out the Romans once and for all and to, to launch a new Davidic throne. Some of them say that when he realized that that was not Jesus' plan, that maybe he even went as far as to try to force Jesus' hand that he never expected Jesus to actually be killed, but he thought that if he would, could just get him arrested, then Jesus would have no choice. He'd have to call in the big guns, and God would have to send his legions to begin the revolution. They say that Judas was maybe just trying to tilt Jesus' hat a little bit. I don't know about you, but Judas is sounding more and more like me each and every second. So what exactly was Judas's sin? Well, first of all, he had a different agenda than Jesus. Okay, but isn't that just like all of us? Isn't that why we celebrated Holy Week and Palm Sunday? To be reminded of all of those times in our lives when we get really excited about the Jesus as we want him to be? the way that we want Jesus to show up and act in our lives and what we want Jesus to do for us instead of accepting Jesus for who he is, what he wants and desires for our life. Second, he may not only have, have had different expectations, but Judas may have also wanted to force Jesus to do things his way. Wow, now that's a new thought. Which one of us doesn't on a daily basis try to bargain with God? How often do we want to sign up to be a follower of Jesus, but to be able to write the rules of what following God means, or at least means for us? 
I wish I had a dime for all the times that I've heard people say, I I'm spiritual, just in my own way. And then, of course, Judas also did betray Jesus, the person that he was closest to in the world. And in so doing, he actually betrayed God as well. This is what we usually see as the unforgivable sin here. But you know, again, I can't let myself think about this too long without thinking of all of the ways I've betrayed God and let down the people that I'm closest to in my life. I think of the times, all the different times that I've chosen my own forms of silver instead of submitting to God's desire and plans for my life. And I wonder if maybe my name should be struck from consideration on people's baby lists as well. But you know what I think the worst sin of Judas was? I don't think it was his mixed up agendas or his attempts to force God to do things his way. I don't even think it was betraying God for 30 pieces of silver. I think that Judas's worst sin was simply that he gave up too early. By going and hanging himself, he refused to allow God the opportunity to do anything new with him. As Tom was preaching last week, I thought, now here's another guy who ought to be on suicide watch. I mean, if you really think about it, Peter's betrayal of Jesus was at least as bad, in some ways maybe even worse than Judas's. Yeah, Judas may have turned Jesus over for silver, but at least he wasn't standing there in the courtyard listening to his best friend being tortured and swearing up and down that he didn't even know who he was. They both had every reason to believe that their sin, their failure, was inexcusable and unforgivable. And yet the main difference between these two men is that Peter stuck around long enough to allow God to redeem him to have that beautiful breakfast on the beach, to be forgiven, to be shown mercy, to be redeemed and reinstated and commissioned for a whole new chapter as a whole new kind of disciple in this world. That image of Jesus and Peter sitting there on the beach and the sun just having rose, it's kind of dark and it's freezing cold, but they're by that warm fire eating that warm fish. It is one of the most beautiful and evocative images in all of scripture. And yet every time I hear it, all I can think about is what it would look like if after that conversation, Jesus had been able to get up and move to another part of the beach and make another little fire and call Judas over for his own breakfast on the beach, what would Jesus have said to him? What would, what would Jesus have wanted to do for Judas in that point? And then how would God have used Judas in a, in a new chapter, a, a second opportunity to be a new kind of disciple? I think one of, the, one of the saddest things of this entire story is that we will never know what God might have done and made of, Jewish, of Judas going forward. Peter had looked God in the face and said, I don't even know you. And yet still God used him to birth and build the church, not just a church, but the church we will never know what God might have done through Judas. His greatest sin was that he simply gave up too early. And so what about you? And what about me? As we make our own preparations to reemerge out of this pandemic, to launch and birth or relaunch and rebirth, one of the most important, celebrate one of the most important Pentecosts in the history of the church. I don't want to sound overly dramatic here, but if God has spared you and you have lived through this past year, then what is God wanting to do with you now? What would your own breakfast on the beach with Jesus look like? 
What do you imagine he would want to say to you? What, what do you imagine he would want to commission you to do in this next chapter, this second chapter of being God's disciple and building God's church, God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? What betrayals and denials? What competing agendas and efforts to tilt God's hand? do we need to let go of so that God can use us for this all-important next chapter of God's church. As we come out of the celebration of this Lent and Easter and begin to emerge out of this crazy, mind-bending year we've been through, I would love to be able to just hate Judas. But the truth is that I see too much of Judas inside of me to simply put him in some kind of a box. Perhaps there is some of Judas inside of all of us. Don't ever give up on God. Don't ever give up on his grace or his forgiveness or his unconditional love. How great is God's love for us? Jesus died for Judas. Remember that the next time you've done something that you think is beyond God's reach. And now, let's go and get busy, because we have a whole new church to build. <laughs>